All right, everybody, it is time for feathers and fur. Hope you are ready uh, for today's class. I'll go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started. So as you know, we're gonna be talking about birds and mammals, um, but first we have some announcements. Next week is a field trip. We're gonna be going to the Wood Duck Pond uh, the, the wood duck preservation site in Auburn. Make, make sure to check the canvas site to see if you're assigned to go on that. If you're, uh, and if you're going to go, um, if you're assigned, you need to email us regardless to let us know you're going to go or not go and let us know your transportation. If you're not assigned and would like to go, uh, please email me and let me know your uh, mode of transportation. This site we're going to have to limit capacity significantly so if you want to go make sure to email sooner rather than later uh, we're going to be meeting in the ka parking lot which is right across the street from rouse i'll send out directions to those who will be attending um, on the note of uh, field hours make sure that you are getting your field hours in so by the end of the semester you need 12 hours of uh, field time dedicated to looking for vertebrate uh, organisms and observing them. So that does not include going to the park and walking your dog and seeing uh, a bird or walking between classes and, and seeing something. They need to be hours that are dedicated to you searching for those organisms. Um, and uh, another announcement is your final proposal draft. So by the time you see this video, I will have uh, my scores updated for your rough draft. Morgan has already put in the scores for rough drafts. Uh, your scores, well, I have a lot of comments on uh, announcements for the proposals. Um, so that's again, that's due next week. Your scores for your rough draft will not necessarily reflect or, or they don't mean that that's going to be your score for the final draft. So don't be complacent if you got a good score. Uh, make sure you look at the rubric and are satisfying all of those points, um, not just uh, for completion, but for content. For the rough draft, we graded almost entirely based on completion. For the final draft, we will, we will be grading based on content. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, but don't be complacent with your rough draft score. If you have any specific questions about updates that you've done to your paper, you can email those to your assigned TA, but we will not be grading entire final drafts or looking at entire, entire final drafts before your submission. Um, for instance, if we recommended that you focus on um, getting an introduction that was a little bit more uh, informative leading up to your hypothesis, uh, and you wanted to know if we, you were on the right track, you could email us and we could let you know. Um, or if you want to know if your figure is it looks good then you can email us that or if your methods are good or whatever um, but then it needs to be a specific question um, are my methods good is is not specific enough of a question saying something more along the lines of you recommended i do this during my rough draft have i have i changed things accordingly or have i changed things appropriately um a, another note prediction is a prediction is not a hypothesis if we made, if we pointed this out to you in your rough draft, a way you can jump from a prediction to a hypothesis is ask yourself the question, why? Uh, why do I predict this happening? And the answer to that question is probably your hypothesis. Remember, a hypothesis is an assertive statement to explain observed phenomena. So uh, keep that in mind. That question, why, will help you. Um, replication pitfalls. While we do not expect you to have an understanding of st what statistical analyses you will be doing in your proposed project, uh, replication is crucial for science. And what that means is having enough samples to uh, adequately test your hypothesis. So if you wanted to know how an algal bloom, a toxic algal bloom was affecting uh, fish, if you looked at one pond that had an algal bloom and another pond that didn't, that would not be adequate to address your hypothesis. The reason being that pond with that algal, the algal bloom 
uh, has many other factors that could be contributing to fish health uh, that are unique to the pond compared to your other control pond. Uh, an appropriate way to do that would be, have mul to, be have, to have multiple ponds with algae, uh, whereas, uh, and then you have multiple control ponds, all of which are independent. So that way you, you know that that is the factor that um, is, is similar between all of those algal plant ponds is the, the algae. Um, if you have any questions about replication, let um, Morgan or me know. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that your goal is to convince the reviewer that you will be successful. Uh, this isn't a project where you should be saying, or a proposal where you should be saying, it might be good to do this, or maybe we'll do this. This should be something that you have planned out uh, and thought out well so that the reviewer knows that you're going to do it. You're going to get it done. They don't want to fund a project that isn't going, uh, that has maybes in it. They want to fund projects that will get done. And on a similar thread, this is a project being done in the future. It's not something that has been done. So don't talk in the past tense. Make sure you're talking in the future tense. Um, and be proactive. You are the researcher. Don't say things along the lines of, I'll find people who know how to do this. Um, you are the people. You are the, the leader. Um, so take an active voice in those. I will do this. I will collaborate with these people. Things of that nature. Uh, for citations, you need to make sure that you have a bibliography at the end of your proposal. And for every claim that isn't common knowledge, uh, so something that wouldn't be typically understood by uh, the general scientist, you need to have a citation for that within the text. Um, if you have any questions about how to do that, contact Morgan and me. We're uh, really depending on the fact that as juniors and seniors, you have experience citing things appropriately. Um, but if you have any questions, make sure to let us know so you don't get points off on that. Um, APA, MLA, Nature, American Naturalist, whatever format you want to do is fine as long as you're consistent and you cite things within the text and have a bibliography. Um, the next thing here is how figures will be graded. Again, we graded those totally on completion. If you had a figure that remotely uh, conveyed the idea of your proposal, you got full credit there. Uh, however, for your final draft, we're going to be grading figures based on the accuracy that they are conveying what you say in the paper, in the proposal, um, efficiency at conveying that message, and aesthetics. So if it's a, just a very... Uh, if it's very unpleasant to look at your figure, you can get points off. You don't need to know how to do things electronically. We encourage you to do these electronically um, on like Illustrator or Inkscape or um, PowerPoint. But if you don't have experience with that, don't spend, waste a bunch of time learning that for this class unless you have time to, to learn those. Um, you can hand draw figures uh, and take a photo. Um, just make sure that it looks good. You're responsible to make sure that uh, you remove all obstacles between you and the reviewer so that they can get um, what they need to get out of that figure. Another note here is to make sure your intro starts broad and narrows, that inverted triangle that uh, I think Morgan really talked about during the um, How to Science video. So you should start with a, your broad overall um, overarching aim of your study. That should be the, the start of your um, introduction, something that is appealing to many fields of science, um, or at least many fields of biology or evolution or ecology. Um, and then you should slowly narrow down to your triangle. It's not a T, so it's not a very broad thing and then you go very narrow should be a broad focus um, and then slowly narrowing down and then the uh, apex or the, the, the point is your hypothesis. Um, sorry if you hear my daughter crying, it's bedtime. So she's a little um, irritable right now. Um, my wife's taking care of her. She's not just out there crying by herself. Um, okay, what's next? Uh, so on a similar thread to your introduction, your study system 
should be justified. And that essentially means, um, okay, that essentially means that it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be apparent that you are focused on the organism instead of, uh, hang on one sec. Okay, I'm back. Where were we? So, oh, justify your study system. Yeah, so don't, don't, I know that you're all in this class because you like some organ, like you love vertebrates, whether it be birds or fish or herps or mammals or all of the above. Um, but to have a successful proposal, generally you need to show that you love questions and you love science rather than just the organisms. So instead of starting your proposal by saying the Bengal tiger or the, uh, the three spine stickleback or the uh, uh, whiptail, the New Mexican whiptail, um, try to start at that really broad question to show that you're question driven rather than organism driven. Uh, and that will help you be not only uh, appeal to a broader audience, but it will uh, show you as more of a, a question-driven scientist versus an organism-driven uh, organism scientist. All right, so that's everything for the proposal final draft. If you have any questions about that, email um, your assigned TA, whether it be uh, Morgan or me. Um, now, what to expect for the lab final exam? I know that you have just taken the diapsid exam by the time you see this, uh, but I think it's good for you to start thinking about what the final exam is going to include. Um, the elements from this PowerPoint that you need to know to get full credit on the final are any organisms in red with an asterisk. Those are those that you need to identify by photo. Um, in addition to those, you may need to know um, uh, sorry, I'm jumping a point, but you may need to know songs for birds or skulls and tracks for mammals. Um, that information is in the lab manual. Make sure that you are aware of that. Um, and we may also ask how you are, were able to identify the animal by, uh, by the photo, how you knew what species it was or what group it belonged to. Uh, and for that, make sure you reference the manual for the traits that are um, specific to whatever the photo, uh, the organism in the photo is. Um, another thing you need to know is the phylogenetic relationships from um, the PowerPoint and the relation to the greater vertebrate phylogeny. And what I mean by the greater vertebrate phylogeny is, uh, let me go back to one of the first trees you studied with the fish. So you do not need to know like the actinopterygii phylogeny. You, we won't be asking you to include anything from that um, or the chondrichthys phylogeny. Uh, but this tree you do need to know and you may need to incorporate information from this tree. Um, so make sure you know this tree well and the other trees are uh, in the phylogeny. Um, but the other one you really need to make sure you know is the diapsid tree. So if we scroll down, don't worry about the frog or the salamander trees. Um, but this tree you do need to know. So be ready for that. Um, there will also be questions from the uh, assigned publication. Make sure to watch Morgan's uh, summary, paper summary video to understand a little bit more about the paper. Those will be essay questions, so be prepared for those. Uh, they will probably be uh, somewhat challenging. So put some time into understanding that paper. Um, and the exam will be a similar format to the previous exams. Um, there won't be um, anything uh, necessarily out of the ordinary compared to those. Okay, a few resources for naturalists that uh, I think are good to know that um, I've talked about uh, and Morgan has talked about a little bit during the course of this class, but um, you should know that these are available to you. Um, our iNaturalist, which is a database that uh, scientists and citizen scientists use to report uh, sightings and observations of uh, organisms. That one's mostly photo-based. So 
you find an organism, take a photo of it, and you can upload it to the database and everybody can see it. Uh, it's something really cool that I encourage you all to uh, use. It's, it's fun and it contributes to um, the greater uh, scientific community. Um, Seek is another cool app. Oh, I should be larger here. Seek is another cool app that is used um, or that you can use where you take a photo of an organism and it can use an algorithm to identify what it is and then you can actually upload it straight to iNaturalist. eBird is a super impressive database um, where people can record information about birds that they've seen at specific localities. Um, and Merlin Bird ID is another app where it can help you identify birds. So since we're talking about birds today, I thought that those would be two apps that would be worth looking into. Um, and I will reference eBird at some per, uh, further point during this PowerPoint. All right, so mammals and birds are what we're focusing on today. So they're accented here in uh, the tetrapod phylogeny. You see that they're very distant. Um, well, they're, they are distantly related. Birds are nested within um, diapsids, whereas mammals are sister to diapsids. Um, so this Saria group here, these are, these are your reptiles. Um, we're going to start by talking about birds since you left off um, last time with the, the rest of the reptiles. So some uh, anatomy to know, uh, feathers primarily used for flight. So all birds have feathers, that is a synapomorphy for birds. Um, two of the types of feathers we want you to know are primary feathers, which are here, secondary feathers, which are located here. I'll point those out a little bit later. Um, the keel, um, you can typically notice with birds, it is a um, highly ossified region that uh, helps with flight. So birds do have uh, reduced bone structure, um, and which is used for uh, decreasing weight. They also can do some really cool stuff with respiration with within their bones, which is interesting. A little outside the scope of this class, but if you want to look up some stuff about bird bones, you'll uh, have some fun reading. Um, and then something else that I didn't include in this figure I made was the beak. Um, so all birds have, have a beak. All right, here's the tree that we're going to work our way through. And we'll start with Paleoagnathae, which is sister to all other birds. Um, not super diverse, but they're, uh, there's some weird birds in here, so they're fun to, to look at. Um, so birds you probably know, the ostrich and the kiwi. Uh, these are flightless birds. They do have wings. Even kiwi have little wings. Um, they look kind of just like uh, balls of fur, um, but they do have wings. And this is actually, these are feathers. They are not, it's not fur. They also have things that look just like whiskers, um, but it's actually modified feathers that are used for sensory perception. Uh, uh, you could say analogous to whiskers. Um, kiwi are also unique. They're nocturnal birds, um, endemic and only found in New Zealand um, with a highly acute uh, olfactory system. So most birds don't have great sense of smell. Kiwi do. And then ostrich, um, another flightless bird, very powerful legs, great runner, has to outrun uh, megafauna in Africa. Um, and other similar birds like ostriches, which are paleoagnaths, have these long necks. So emu, cassowary are other birds that fall within these groups uh, or within this group. Moving on from there, uh, now we're in the neoagnathae group. Um, and the first tree, uh, the first lineage we're going to look at is galloanserae. Um, so this is a, uh, a group where in the fossil record, um, Birds with similar morphology were around even before the, uh, the end of the Cretaceous period. So they survived that big massive KT um, uh, mass extinction. And two orders within this group, Galloanserae, are Galliformes, which are heavy bodied, mostly ground dwelling birds that when they fly, it's just for short bursts. These are your quail, your chickens, uh, your turkeys. Um, and the one that you need to know for class is the Bob White quail. And you also need to know the song, so we'll take a look, listen to that. Mm. 
Bob White, Bob White. I don't know if it actually sounds like that, but that might help you remember that it's a Bob White quail. That's what, how some people categorize the sound. Um, so another heavy bodied uh, ground feeding order within Gallinaceae is Anseriformes, which are waterfowl. Um, so this includes ducks and geese. Uh, here, the bird you need to know is the mallard, um, really uh, beautiful bird with iridescent green coloration on the head. In males, they have a yellow bill, um, a white ring around the neck. Um, they also have iridescent markings on the wings that you can see when they're in flight. Females are uh, more of a, a drab coloration. Um, these are interesting in uh, that most birds have no copulatory organ. So to reproduce, the male just has to get the cloaca close to the female and try to deposit sperm into the female's cloaca. Whereas with uh, ducks, not only do they have a copulatory organ, but the penis of, of ducks, at least in birds like the ruddy duck uh, group, I think are the largest penis to body ratio of any animal. I would have to double check that, but they're much longer, like multiple times the length of the bird. Um, so it's very interesting that in this group of, with you know, roughly 10,000 species, almost all of which don't have copulatory organs, um, these ducks have developed them in like to an extreme. Um, and the females have very intricate um, reproductive organs themselves, which represent the antagonistic coevolution that has occurred between males and females within the same species. So a lot of studies on sexual conflict um, uh, focus on, on ducks. Uh, so for the mallard, uh, this is the call that you need to know for your exam. So that's a, um, I think it's a male in flight. Uh, a lot of you can probably correct me if I'm wrong there, but um, that is a, a mallard call there, flight call. All right. Um, the next group we're going to look at is Stricerys. This is a pretty remarkable group, uh, one of my favorite lineages by far. Uh, two groups within here are your um, hummingbirds. I don't have the order here. It's Apodiformes and then Capramulgiformes, um, within which the uh, Capramulgidae family is, um, are your night jars, night hawks, whippoorwills. A really interesting group that you don't need to know for the exam. Um, it's not in red, there's no asterisk. However, uh, anything I mention in this PowerPoint um, that is in addition to those things I said will be on the exam, uh, might be on the exam for extra credit. So to get full credit, you don't need to know anything but the things in red with an asterisk, but, um, or the phylogenies. But the other things I mentioned might be on there for extra credit. So talking about things that uh, definitely have potentially on the exam, um, this is the ruby-throated hum hummingbird. Um, hummingbirds are remarkable for many reasons. Uh, they beat their wings at 80 uh, beats per uh, second, not minute, per second. So 80 flaps per second, um, which means that they need to be metabolizing energy at an incredibly high rate. And they do so by getting tons of sugar, um, lots of simple sugars from flower nectar. So they have coevolution going on with flowers. Anytime you see those uh, tube-like flowers, they could be co-evolving with um, hummingbirds so that the bird sticks its bill into the, the flower, is able to get some nectar, and in the process picks up a lot of pollen that it moves between flowers. Um, but because of that high metabolism, which is extremely demanding for the bird, um, they have to be constantly eating. So at night, they could not maintain a similar metabolic rate. So what they do is, you'll see in the lab manual, they go into this torpor, which is uh, a state where their metabolic, metabolic rate dra drops drastically, um, their body temperature drops drastically, and they're just like out cold. Um, 
And if you've ever seen a hummingbird in torpor, it's, it's pretty interesting. You can YouTube it, but sometimes they're hanging upside down and they're just, they're totally out of it. Um, and then once they start waking up, their uh, systems start picking up again so they can start flying around. Um, their unique flying strategy allows them to fly forward, backward, up, down. Um, sometimes they can go upside down, um, which is a, a skill that they use. All these, all those flying skills in like dog fights that go on in the air. Um, and they are very uh, aggressive with one another. They, they fight over their feeding areas. Um, so they're, they're fun to watch. If, if you ever can get a hummingbird feeder um, in Alabama, you can watch them in the um, spring and summer, early fall. Uh, however, you won't see these right now. So unfortunately, anybody who wrote a proposal about hummingbirds, um, you wouldn't be able to do it before the end of the semester because they're gone. Um, and I'll show you using eBird something cool uh, that will show why they're not around. Um, so with eBird, I'm just going to look up um, eBird abundance, uh, abundance maps. I actually want abundance animations. So let's see, we'll just come in here. This is bald eagle abundance of animation, but we can um, we can go back to all abundance animations. That's really what we want. I wanted to show you how to get here because this is these are fun tools that you can you can play around with. Um, all species. So here let's look up the ruby throated hummingbird. And this, uh, this takes data. So eBird is just people going outside and recording the birds they see. And from that data, because there are so many people who love birds and are passionate about um, birds and recording data on birds, um, this, these types of maps are able to be produced. So you can see here we're in February, March, April. Look where the birds are. Oh, now they're coming up to, um, to where we are in Alabama and Northern. And then as soon as you get down into October, they're gone. So we have no hummingbirds now. So I love this animation because it's using data just from people recording these birds to show migration patterns. Uh, so you can look at this in, in many of the other birds of um, North, Central, and South America. Um, it's fun to play around with if, if you ever want to check it out. Uh, but that's ruby-throated hummingbirds. Um, you don't need to know a, a, any call for them. Um, as far as I know, they, they don't have songs. Uh, they do do dances. So these, uh, actually one more thing that I do need to mention, uh, the, the coloration here on the um, neck region is, this is a male, and this is used for sec, uh, sexual mate choice, so female choice. And you'll notice that here towards the front, it looks yellow. And back here, you have orange. And then finally, the ruby coloration that gives them their name. Um, those colors aren't, it's, it's not, that's not how the colors always are. It's dependent on the angle and the um, refraction of light. Uh, so this type of coloration is known as iridescence. Um, it's a structural coloration. So it's not, uh, it's not a result of compounds that are emitting light. Um, rather, the way the light is hitting the structures of the feathers and the way it's being reflected it, and it is, uh, allows for different interpretations of these, these colors or uh, different, um, different colors that are being interpreted. So as this male would move his head, you would see different colors in different regions. And they do that. They move their heads back and forth when they're signaling to females. Uh, and there are remarkable colors throughout all of the apodiformes, so you should, you should definitely look into that. All right, all of that information could be on the exam. I'm not going to talk like this for every species, but um, this is one that is, is good and we can't see in the field. So consider this like a field fun fact session that I gave you about a native species that has migrated across the Gulf of Mexico um, to Central, uh, Central America. Um, that we can't see right now. Um, so the other group that you 
uh, don't necessarily need to know on the exam but might be there for extra credit is uh, caprimulgiformes. Um, these are in Alabama. Um, everything so well, um, the everything so far has is in Alabama except for the ostriches and kiwi. Um, caprimulgiformes has uh, some very uh, unique calls. These are dusk, crepuscular, and nocturnal um, birds, and you'll hear these common these calls commonly in. Alabama at uh, dusk and at night. I'm sure many of you know what that is. That's a whippoorwill. Whippoorwill, whippoorwill. I get its common name. And this is Chuck Will's widow. So see if you can see why it's called Chuck Will's widow. I, I like the, the names of the, the fun names that people give the songs. Might, may or may not be helpful, but they're still fun. Um, okay, so Columbaves is the next group we're gonna look at. These are um, relatively heavy body um, flying bird, uh, birds that fly more often than, much more often than the, um, the other group we looked at, Galliformes. Uh, but they do have um, like a large, breast region similar to the uh, Galliformes. Um, they have powerful flight muscles. Um, Galliformes also has very powerful flight muscles that are used for burst flight. Um, doves, the way I tell them apart from other birds, they're very elegant looking. Um, they don't have a lot of feathers that are um, causing irregularities. You can draw the shape of them very smoothly on the eye and the um, shape of the eye and around the eye is very elegant um, to the pointed beak. Um, uh, this is a morning dove and morning doves have uh, black spotting along the wings and white on the tail. When you see them fly, that kind of borders the tail. Uh, they're called morning doves, not because um, they're out in the morning, like before afternoon, but it's morning as in grieving. And that uh, common name, as far as I know, comes from the sound of their call, it sounds like they're grieving. You can hear a lot of birds here, but that focal noise is the one that is them. Right there. I tried to pick some common um, calls that you'll hear other than the Bob White. That's not one you'll hear commonly, but this one you probably hear right outside your house. All right, Gruiformes, these are wading birds, um, have very long legs, large feet. Um, so this is the American coot. It looks kind of like waterfowl when it's out on the water, but um, when it starts walking around, you definitely notice something different. They do have webbed feet, but they have very long legs, um, dark colored birds. Um, and here, this is a sandhill crane. Um, these birds are um, well known in, in our region because of their conservation status. They're, um, they're very threatened with, along with other cranes, such as whooping cranes. Um, you can tell them apart. They have very large wingspan. Here you can really see those secondary feathers and the primary fl uh, flight feathers. Um, they are migratory. Um, and they have a red crest, so they have this long neck um, long legs and a red crest at the top of the head. And that's not feather coloration, that's actually the skin, exposed skin. Um, so those are Shandhill cranes. All right, moving along into a core lithornithes. Uh, these are more aquatic and semi-aquatic shore birds, um, wading birds, uh, gulls, seabirds. Um, so here are some of the birds that you need to know are the great blue heron, very long legs, similar to the cranes, um, but not, not closely, necessarily closely related to the cranes. Uh, we'll look back at the phylogeny in a little bit. But a long, elegant neck that they keep tucked um, in this S shape, especially when they're flying, they'll untuck it when they're eating, um, in a dagger-like yellow bill. They also have these elongated feathers hanging off the back and a black um, crown at the top of the head. Laughing gulls. This is a good opportunity for you to see differences in um, color pattern. These are, this is the same species. This here is during the summer. This here is during the winter. So birds do molt and they can change their coloration 
which they use to their advantage, especially for um, mate choice. Um, so during the breeding season, they could have different um, pattern, different coloration than they have in the, um, in the non-breeding season. You do need to know the laughing gull call. It's um, a somewhat typical gull call with um, kind of a declining uh, laugh, laughing rhythm. So we'll listen to that real quick. <laughs> So you hear some typical goal kind of cawing there, and then you also will hear that laugh that descends. Um, a couple other birds, pelicans are also included in this group, and sandpipers, some other notables. These are all in Alabama, all of these birds here. Um, this roseate spoonbill is really cool. It picks up um, color, uh, it's beautiful coloration from its environment, carotenoids, and things like shrimp, that then converts to um, colors in its plumage. Um, same here with this stilt. Um, it's a really cool group of birds. So everything I show you is in Alabama, unless I say otherwise. Ostrich, kiwi, not in Alabama. Everything else has been in Alabama. Okay, the next group we're looking at, um, and one more note with Acor lithornithes is its sister to this group. It's more closely related to falcons than it is to those cranes, which is interesting given its um, ecology. So falcons, the only falcon you need to know is an American kestrel. A very elegant bird of prey. Uh, bird of prey means that it eats um, live organisms such as birds um, that aren't insects. So birds, mammals um, will also eat herps. Um, and birds of prey have recurved beaks for tearing flesh. Um, they're meat eaters, they're, they're carnivores. And then talons for, for catching things. They also have remarkable eyesight. So here you see um, a very beautiful um, brown on the back with gray wings and some modeling. Um, and then on the, the bottom, you have more of a pale, almost um, amberish, uh, pale orange. So that's the American kestrel. Um, Falconiformes, so all your falcons are within that group, are sister to passeriformes. And I want you to notice the species richness within these clades. Aves as a whole has about 10,000 species. More than half, well more than half of those are within this group, Passeriformes. Um, and a lot of times when birds are being described new species, it's within this group. So this is a hyper diverse group of birds. Um, they're known as the perching birds. Formerly they were called, commonly called songbirds because there's a, a lot of birds that use songs, but there's also songbirds in other groups. There's also perching groups birds and other groups so it's kind of a weird term um, but they have three toes facing forward um, one toe facing back as you can see here with all these birds um, you only need to focus on three it's really unjust because most birds are perching birds but these are the three we expect you to know um, so many of the perching birds have tons of calls and songs um, for instance crows have like 30 different calls um, or, um, and a few songs, um, but we're only requiring you to, to know one for the American crow. This is the American crow. Uh, it's a very typical crow call. So I'm sure many of you have heard that around Auburn. Cardinals have a number of songs and calls. Um, and they are very uh, common in, in Auburn. So I hear these outside my house almost every, every day. So that's one of my favorite calls that really high down to a, deep, uh, a lower note. Um, those, are, those are cardinals when you hear that, but they also do this call. It sounds kind of like a laser, a laser gun. So 
That's also a cardinal. And then in that background, you hear the doo doo. That's also a cardinal. And they also do this call, which you'll hear outside too. So a very uh, diverse um, set of calls, and there's there's many more. Um, and then going to the extreme, uh, you have mockingbirds, which have their own set of calls, and then just can mimic almost anything else. Um, their own calls aren't aren't super beautiful, so this is this is one of them. They're very raspy, um, but then the songs that they mimic. Um, it can be a diverse, uh, of diverse nature. Uh, you can know it's a mockingbird even though you don't see it because they usually repeat the same thing for a few times before then jumping to something else. So if you hear something, you're like, oh, that's a cardinal. And you're like, oh, wait, that's a crow. Oh, wait, that's a, um, a titmouse. Oh, wait, that's a, um, oh, I don't know, Phoebe, an Eastern Phoebe. Then that's probably a mockingbird. They're just hopping around all over the place. So here, in this part, you'll, uh, or in this file, you hear the uh, mockingbird repeat a few things and then jump to something else. one almost sounds like somebody opening a car. I don't know what it is. All right, so the next group is Accipitromorphae. These are your hawks, eagles, kites, um, and vultures. So the first one you need to know here is a turkey vulture. has exposed skin on the face. Um, very red skin um, can be seen. Um, these are considered raptors, actually. Uh, they have dark feathers, except for at the uh, caudal region of their wing where it's light and that helps you tell them apart from black vultures. Here you can really see the secondary feathers and the primary feathers. They also have a very acute sense of smell um, and there should be asterisks here on these. I'll make sure that the PowerPoint I upload has asterisks. Uh, and then the other bird you need to know here uh, is the red-tailed hawk and you do need to know the call for this. I'm sure many of you have heard this. So that, that call, um, a lot of times is used in movies for like an eagle or in, um, I don't know, commercials, but it's, it's a hawk. Eagles have more of a chirping noise. Um, so red-tailed hawks um, have really cool kind of scream-like calls. Um, they have a red uh, at the base of the tail. They also have reddish coloration on the shoulders, um, or not the base of the tail, the whole tail is red. Um, and then their wings are, are more broad. That's very typical for these um, hawks of this genus, Budia. Um, but you can also see the recurved beak here. They have talons for capturing prey, um, good eyesight, similar to the falcons. However, you'll notice that falcons are not sister to eagles and hawks. They're more closely related to perching birds. And eagles and hawks are more closely related to owls and woodpeckers, um, based on our uh, current understanding of the evolutionary a tree for birds. So the next group is str Um This one is not in your lab manual, I don't think, so I'll, I'll remove the asterisk and the, the color. Um, but this is a barred owl. Really cool owls. Um, at least I don't think they're in your lab manual. I'll double check. Um, whatever I upload to, to the PowerPoint I upload is the one you need to know. Um, they have very uh, typical uh, calls you'll hear frequently in the southeast. Sounds like they're saying, who cooks for you? Me too. So I'll go ahead and play that. <laughs> or not who cooks for you, me too. Who cooks for you, who cooks for you, is what they'll say. Um, they have stereo vision, um, all, all owls, the, those eyes right on the front of the face. 
uh, with um, these big uh, wells to allow them to see. They're all nocturnal, so it helps them see in the dark. Um, they also, they don't have ears on the top of their head. Sometimes these ears get, these tufts, these are feathers get confused for ears. Their ears are placed laterally. Um, they're also raptors. They have recurved um, beaks and talons and, and consume um, fleshy prey items. Um, the one you do need to know here is the great horned owl, the largest owl in North America. Um, and it's call, it has a couple of calls. The first one is a very typical owl um, call that you know of. It sounds like it's saying, uh, who's awake? Me too. <laughs> However, another call that you could hear, and it's not a screech owl, it um, very likely is a great horned owl, is a screech-like call. So you can hear them call back and forth with that screech call. Um, all right, the next group is Carisia morphe. These are your... Uh, Included within this group are your woodpeckers and kingfishers, two birds you need to know. Um, they both have very um, robust beaks. Kingfishers are fish eaters, so you'll see them hanging out near water. The belt, this is the belted kingfisher. The females have like a rusty belt across the, um, the uh, middle of the body. Um, really pretty blue-gray coloration. Uh, and then this is a pileated woodpecker. Uh, mostly a black body with a black stripe through the eye and a brilliant red crest. Um, and I'm sure that many of you have, have heard, heard woodpeckers around town, um, either building their nests or looking for food. So they do build their nests within cavities that they um, dig into trees. This is what the um, pileated woodpecker sounds like. So that drumming that um, declines steadily. Um, but they also have a call that is um, a, a really awesome, beautiful call. I get excited when I hear that in the field. Um, all right, so those are all the birds you need to know. We'll go ahead and jump into the, uh, that was the feathers, now we're gonna jump into the fur, the mammals. So some anatomical terms you need to know. Uh, we do want you to know the skulls because a lot of times you don't see these mammals in the field. They may see you, but they're very cryptic. They're not like birds where they're um, out and able to see. Um, and you can't really just roll back a log and find a mammal. Um, you can do that with moles, found moles that way, but um, you're not gonna find like a bobcat by um, rolling back a log. So, but they do, they will um, leave tracks. They're heavy bodied, a lot of them, and they leave tracks that you can see. Uh, and their skulls are very, um, very robust, and so mammal skulls you can find frequently. Um, so they are heterodont, uh, or they have heterodont dentition. So here you can see different types of teeth, whereas every other organism we've talked about uh, so far has the same uniform dentition throughout the, the jaw. Um, so here within uh, this mammal skull, you can see the incisors in the front. The canines, which are these enlarged teeth for uh, piercing flesh, uh, premolars and molars for tearing flesh. Um, and the dentition type can be different depending on the diet. So here, this, these are, this is very obviously a carnivore, but you'll see as we look at skulls differences. Um, the zygomatic arch is the slot where the mandible can slide into the top of the skull um, and uh, mass masticator muscles can uh, go through there to assist with chewing and I guess just jaw strength overall um, and then you have these auditory bola which I'll point out those encapsulate the um, portions of the inner ear that have uh, been derived from the ancestor and um, as you probably learn in lecture about the, uh, the intricacies of the mammalian inner ear um, so they do have fur, mammals have fur, as you can see here. Um, the the brisae or the whiskers are um, fur that is used, hairs that are used for sensory perception. And then mammary glands are an important trait that mammals have to provide nutrients for their offspring. 
Uh, for all of the animals listed here, you need to make sure that you know these tracks um, in order to identify them by their tracks. So let's work our way through the tree. We'll start with monotremes, which are sister to all mammals. They're not very diverse, but they are very weird. So first, the duck-billed platypus. Um, the, all monotremes are, are oviparous, so they lay eggs. They're not live-bearing. This is the only venomous mammal. So it's got a venom gland in its hind leg and a spur used to inject venom. Um, the bill is used for sensory perception. They don't see very well, and when they're underwater looking for food, they use that bill to feel around. Um, and you can see here with the skull, um, it, it's um, very empty here at the front, and that's because there's a lot of nerve endings that are used for those, that perception. Um, echidnas look kind of like porcupines. Um, got these hairs modified as long spines. Um, another trait for monotremes is they only have one, um, they don't have separate urogenital or separate um, openings to excrete waste, they have a single cloaca. All right, now we're moving into theria. Um, and the first group we're gonna look at, so these are placental mammals. Um, the first one, metatheria, uh, although they are placental, the embryo develops or leaves the womb early, crawls up the mother into a pouch where it develops as a joey. Um, there's two primary groups, Australadelphia, which, um, oh, I need to mention, neither of these are in Alabama. So again, everything up to this point, except for um, the ostrich and the kiwi, are in Alabama. Now, platypus and echidnas are not in Alabama. And neither are any of the marsupials of this Australadelphia group. These are all in Australia. However, at some point, uh, marsupials evolved in Australia. They crossed over. Um, through, as far as we know, through Antarctica, and it wasn't frozen, um, and it was attached to Australia, into South America. So there are marsupials in South America within this group, Amerodelphia. A lot of possums. Um, and some of those migrated up to, um, across the Panamanian land bridge, and we have one species of marsupial here in Alabama. It's the Virginia possum. Um, so here looking at its skull, you can see that heterodont dentition. Um, they don't have those auditory, auditory bola. So that's how you can tell it apart from some of the carnivores, um, even though it has these large canines that look similar. All right, now we're going to move into eutheria, the true placental mammals. So these don't crawl out and develop further in a pouch. Um, they undergo a, a significant amount of development in the womb connected to the placenta before they, uh, and the uterus connected to the placenta before they are um, born. So the first group we'll look at is the Narthra within this crazy group, Atlanta Janata. There's not a lot of species in these lineages, but they are remarkable. So the Narthra include, includes your sloths, your anteaters, your armadillos. Here I'm just showing you need to know anteater and armadillo, and you need to know the skulls. You can see here, this just is a strange looking skull. It's highly ossified. And that's typical to animals that are fossorial. So armadillos are sticking their face into dirt and digging deep holes into the dirt to find uh, food items, such as like grubs. Um, and if any of you have had armadillos like in your um, yard, you'll know that they can just tear up your yard with all these little face holes um, everywhere. Um, and it's pretty remarkable that they can do that with just their face. Uh, but you can see that they have this reinforced skull so that they can have that um, ability to do so. Anteaters also have a crazy skull for a different reason. Um, the mandible and the maxilla are fused shut and the tongue just comes in and out to feed on ants. Um, this is not an organism that's in Alabama. These armadillos are. Um, another remarkable trait for these armadillos is their armor that is used to deter or as a defense against predators. All right, Afritheria, um, elephants, rock hyrax, not in um, Alabama. So weird that these things are related to each other and that they're both related to this organism, which is in Alabama. This is a manatee. Um, and manatees are herbivorous. So you can see here, um, they don't have that heterodont dentition we're used to seeing in mammals. They just have these uh, plain molars that are used to chew up uh, vegetation. Um, so these are fully aquatic mammals. They reside completely in the water. And if you look at their toes, I should have had their toes here, but they look, um, 
remarkably not like other uh, mammals that are restricted to the water. They look almost more like an elephant, an elephant hoof. Um, these are commonly known as, known as sea cows, dugongs or other sea cows within this group. All right, we're gonna jump over to primates. Um, before I forget, another important thing to note is, look how many mammals there are. Under 6,500, there are more passerines, more perching birds than there are mammals. So the, if the perching birds knew about this class, they would be really upset that we look at this many mammals and we look at three perching birds. But with 10,000 birds, we can only, it's not an ornithology class, so um, we, we do our best. Um, but mammals are, are remarkable uh, in all of the different body types and um, we give them their due. A lot of people like mammals that take this class too. Um, so that's part of it. And primates, you don't need to know any primates for this uh, exam or for the class. But I do want, well, you don't need to be able to identify them, but I do want you to um, actually be able to draw a phylogeny for primates and specifically for all the primates shown here. This is a gorilla, this is a macaque, this is a bonobo or a chimpanzee, closely related to a chimpanzee. This is an orangutan. This is a capuchin new world monkey. Um, the macaques are old world monkeys. Um, well, they're within old world uh, monkeys. Uh, this is a lemur and this is a human being. I want you to pause the video and draw the relationships for these. I hope you did it. Okay, I will now draw it quickly. Um, so I'm going to use this app called Excaladraw that you can use to draw figures um, for your proposal. So the out group here is actually lemurs. This is going to be a beautiful phylogeny. Um, so lemurs are sister to everything else in that image. Um, the next thing that, that is sister to everything else is the um, New World monkeys. So I'm just going to write New World monkey. After that, uh, let's see how do I want to do this. After that, you have your um, macaque. Um, I'll, I'm going to write Old World monkeys here. Um, then you have your orangutan. Then your gorilla. What is that? Then the gorilla. And chimps and humans are sister. Uh, I, I said bonobo. Bonobos, chimps. So what you'll notice here are a couple of things. Um, the monkeys are paraphyletic. Really monkeys, these are monkeys. So if people ever say to you like, Evolution believes that humans came from monkeys. That's not true. Humans are monkeys. <laughs> um, apes are here. I think these are actually the, maybe the great apes. I can't remember. So if anybody says humans came from apes, that's also not true. Humans are apes. So those are two things that we want you to know for the lab for the mammals. All right. The next group we're looking at are rodents. Look at the numbers here too. This is a hyperdiverse group in relation to the other mammals, over 2,000 species. You need to know three of these for your exam. The gray squirrel, which is a cute furry uh, rodent with a big bushy tail. You can tell its skull from other rodents. 
um, by its, it has a little peg tooth. Um, so all rodents have a very big gap between their first two large incisors um, and their, uh, the other teeth within the, uh, the maxilla. Um, and there's a little tiny peg tooth right before these molars. So you see it, I don't, you can barely see it right there, right there. So that's, that's the gray squirrel. And now we can see the auditory bola. Um, I don't think we've had any other uh, skulls where we can see that yet. Um, actually, don't, I, I think that our uh, armadillos do have that. But these are those auditory bola that encapsulate those inner ears. Um, so that's a gray squirrel skull. A uh, flying squirrel is another one you didn't need to know. You don't need to know the skull, but this is a rodent. Um, and this is a beaver skull. So again, you can see that big gap between the teeth. Um, and then the teeth are being orange in both the squirrel and the beaver, that's iron. So iron helps to reinforce those teeth um, for all the chewing that they do of um, nuts and trees. Um, the beavers are extremely enlarged. So that's how you can tell them apart. Okay, lagomorphs, these are sister to rodents. They're not rodents. Rabbits are not rodents, um, but they're very closely related. Uh, here is a gray uh, or a eastern cottontail. Um, eastern cottontail skull. You also have that big gap between the incisors. And the incisors of both lagomorphs and rodents just grow continuously. Um, but you can also have a second set of tooth that don't grow continuously. Um, they're small, peg-like, right behind those incisors. That's how you can tell the cottontail skull. All right, Eulipotiphia. These are your moles and shrews. You need to know uh, the eastern mole, Scolopus aquaticus. Um, all moles have this very interesting um, uh, nose at the tip of their rostrum that is mobile, so it moves around. Um, they also have a highly ossified skull for their burrowing lifestyle and extremely reduced eyes. Um, so you can see from the paws here, those are used for burrowing. The skull um, is ossified for their burrowing lifestyle. And they have teeth to crush those different types of arthropods that they come across. Um, so these are fossorial animals for the most part. Shrews aren't, but um, the moles, moles are. Uh, Chiroptera is another hyperdiverse group of mammals. Mammals are mostly rodents and um, bats. So bats are unique in that they're the only mammals to develop true flight. There's a lot of gliders. There's gliders that are rodents. There's gliders that are marsupials. Um, but bats actually have um, evolved the ability to fly. Um, they're nocturnal. Uh, you can see here the, um, the arm through. So it's the arm that's modified in wings, similar to birds. Um, but actually, the digits are different than that of birds. I'm not sure if you talk about that in uh, lecture, but here you can see the thumb hanging off um, the wing, which is used for, for gripping things. Um, here in the skull, uh, you can see that they have these large um, uh, canines used for uh, defense and preying on things, and then they have teeth to, to shear items, uh, depending on their, their, their diet. And then they also have a, a remarkable array um, of diverse uh, maxilla morphology. And so here you see that there's a divided maxilla. Uh, this does uh, happen occasionally in humans, but this is the um, general morphology of bats. And there's, there's hypotheses that it might have to do with an insectivorous diet and catching food items on the wing that it helps with echolocation but that's being, something being actively studied. So here are some of the different types of morphology and different bats. The bat you need to know here is the big brown bat native to Alabama. Um, these are diverse bat species and you can check out this publication if you're interested in, in knowing more. All right, carnivores, not a super diverse group, but everybody loves them. So you need to know three. Uh, first is the bobcat. Um, all cats are carnivores. Um, a trait, that all carnivores have is you'll notice that the eyes are typically loaded um, at the front of the face. Um, they have, um, and that's, that's for being able to uh, actively prey on, um, on different animals. 
Uh, the bobcat in particular, you can kind of tell apart from other cats um, by it's got massive paws compared to the rest of its body, a short tail, um, and it also has these tufts of fur hanging off the face to widen the face. Um, this is the only, uh, not the only, but it's one of the only native cats to Alabama. Um, uh, cougars are also native to Alabama, mountain lions, but um, you don't see them here anymore. They, they're fully extirpated, although occasionally um, one from Florida from the disjunct populations may wander up, but they used to all be here. Uh, we used to have uh, panthers, cougars here in Alabama. Um, the skull of the bobcat is easy to tell apart because it, it's blunt, it's not long, um, whereas uh, some carnivores, such as canines, have a much lar longer face. Um, all, cane, uh, all, um, all carnivores have these very large canine teeth. Um, here you can also see uh, mandibular canines for the um, bobcat. And they also have uh, premolars and molars that are used for tearing flesh. Um, more so in bobcats and like this raccoon skull because raccoons would just eat a lot of stuff. Um, but you can still see it here. So you see how sharp these uh, molars and premolars and molars are for, for tearing at flesh. Um, so we'll just jump into the uh, raccoon. They've got bushy striped tail, uh, a black mask across the face. Um, very typical uh, or very common animals within Alabama. Um, a longer snout, not quite as long as some of the canids, but uh, like um, coyotes here in Alabama, um, and but not as short as the cat. And the um, canines are also aren't as large as those in the bobcat. Um, another native carnivore we have here in Alabama is the river otter, and these are uh, unique in carnivores. Uh, well, at least within their their, um, their family, the weasels and um, the badgers, because they have a compressed skull. So you'll see how it's uh, dorsal ventrally flattened. That's an adaptation for swimming, for streamlined swimming. Um, and we also see that in other swimmers um, that are carnivores, such as the pinnipeds, which are the seals and the sea lions. They aren't closely related to, um, to otters. Otters are closely related to uh, weasels. So that is convergent evolution there, the compression of the skull for um, efficient swimming. Um, so I don't have any pinnipeds here, but they are carnivores. And then a couple of other um, carnivores that are found in Alabama are black bears, um, also somewhat rare, um, and foxes, so like a gray fox, um, which do have an elongated, elongated skull similar to what you see in like a coyote. Um, you can tell the gray fox from the red fox because it's got much more gray on it than the red fox. It's all, its face is a little bit shorter and it has a different sagittal crest, um, but I guess we're not talking about skulls. Of, so you don't need to know either of these. They might pop up as extra credit. All right, second to last group, Parasidactyla, um, the least diverse lineage here of the Therian mammals. These are the odd-toed ungulates. You don't need to know any of them. Um, but they include rhinoceros, zebras, and horses, tapirs. Um, cool group. Um, the, uh, sorry, those are the odd-toed ungulates, Parasidactyla. Sidartiodactyla are the even-toed ungulates. Um, so these include uh, some of the artiodactyls that you're probably familiar with, such as um, cows, deer, elk, bison. Um, antelope, uh, whereas the, so those are artiodactyls. The set in the name set artiodactyla comes from cetaceans, uh, which include dolphins and whales. So these are um, more closely related to um, artiodactyls than they are to any other mammals, which is pretty remarkable um, because artiodactyls are uh, almost entirely um, herbivorous, which with the exception of maybe hippos that might, you know, eat, eat something. Um, there are some omnivores, um, something other than vegetation, whereas the cetaceans have uh, multiple instances of carnivory. Um, so for the skulls, you do, it's listed in the manual that you need to know the bison skull. We're not going to do that one. 
Um, the reason I like you to know the bison skull is because in the lab you can see it and how majestic and massive that skull is. Uh, but I just want you to be able to identify the bison from a photo. Um, this is one of the iconic animals of North America. It's a huge artiodactyl, a massive skull. Um, these antlers that you'll see in, um, or horns in some of the artiodactyls are used for male-male competition in order to decide who gets to mate with um, sometimes large herds of females. Um, and so they compete with one another um, using those items. You also see um, those in rams and sheep. Um, so the bison has a large, huge skull, um, huge front body. It's just a large bodied mammal. Um, paired horns that are, um, are uh, single horns on either side of the head and tons of fur dressing the face and the anterior region of the body. Um, the other artiodactyl you need to know is the white-tailed deer. So bison are not native to Alabama. White-tailed deer is. Um, their skulls, you know, I used to, before I knew much about their skulls, I used to always think they were broken because they look so weird. They have no incisors. They've just got the teeth back here, but this is a, this is a, um, a, a white-tailed deer skull in good shape. Um, they're just uh, a little bit different because uh, that the vomeral nasal region here is highly refined for an acute sense of smell to be able to detect uh, predators. Um, and then they just need these molars for munching down veggies. Um, the males do get these antlers, these ossified regions that they use for male-male competition. Um, White-tailed deer uh, also, when they're alarmed, will flip up their tail. That's where they get their name from. The um, underside of the tail is uh, bright white. Um, okay, so the cetaceans, you'll see here, this uh, is a bottlenose dolphin. You need to know this skull. Homodont dentition. Um, and just a lot of crazy stuff going on. I can't imagine what I would have thought this was if I'd never seen a dolphin skull. The uh, nasal opening is here in the middle top of the head, which is where you see that um, blowhole. Um, the eyes are located down here laterally. Um, and you see this that again, that dorsoventral compression that is uh, convergent with um, the pinnipeds and the, the otters. That's used for streamlined swimming as well. All right, that is the whole, uh, the whole bur, uh, fur and feathers lecture. I know it was somewhat long. Um, good luck studying everything. I'll make sure to put this on Canvas. If you have any questions about something, uh, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I look forward to seeing some of you next week during the field trip and I will see you all later.